For the next few minutes that I have, I only have 15 minutes left, I want to just do some very quick, quick work with, uh, with VEMPs because I have more and more practices that are doing VEMPs. And you don't have to have anything special to do VEMPs. If you have evoke potential equipment and you want to start doing C VEMPs and O VEMPs, you can do it. Now, some equipment does a better job at it than others. I told you about that VivoSonic Integrity, that does great. But if you have a Biologic or a Grayson Stadler or an Interacoustics uh, Evoke Potential Equipment, you can do it without any, anything special, okay? Uh, and it's getting very, very popular. Every day another practice calls me and says, the doctor wants us to start doing VEMPs, uh, you know, can you set that up on our equipment? And a lot of times the protocol's already in there, but it's hidden and you just don't know, know it. And I could always put it in for them with no problem. I could even do it over the phone. Uh, and it's, it's another test that we're adding to our battery of tests to increase our sensitivity. Now with, with uh, the video head impulse test and with CVEMPs and OVEMPs added to VNG testing, which is now better than it's ever been, and maybe adding some other things like that visual, dynamic visual acuity or subjective a visual vertical test. We just have, we have a great battery of tests that are quick and they're easy uh, and, and, the, and they are effective. And the sensitivity of vestibular testing, which was down here, but I remember you guys, none of these here is old enough to remember when we used to do ENG instead of VNG. And we used to do it on a strip chart. Greg, I know you are. Uh, we used to do it on a strip chart. <laughs> Anita, I know, all right, all right, so there's three of you guys, plus me, all right, four, five, six, no, no, I didn't, thought you guys were much younger than this. Uh, usually when you go to places audiolo with audiologists, I talk to a lot of students, uh, and I'm telling them about the progression of equipment ever since the technology started. A lot of times it started in the 60s or 70s, and I'm talking about things that happened and were developed in the, six, in the 70s and 80s, and they're going, oh, that's before I was born. <laughs> Shut up, everything was before you were born. Jeez. Oh. All right, so this, what, what a vamp is, is a, uh, it's, if you do conventional testing, all you're doing is testing part of the system, you know, one semicircular canal when you're doing ENG or VNG. So to make the test more sensitive, adding VEMP is something you can do, and usually you don't have to spend a dime because you already have the equipment. It's just a matter of putting a, a, a special protocol in for it and learning the technique. It's been around for a long time. It just people weren't using it on commercially available equipment. You see how long it's been around. Uh, and what is it? It's an EMG, all right? Electromyography is EMG. It's a muscle response. And it's recorded from the sternocleidomastoid muscle, or the SCM muscle, which once, when you contract it, you can see it right here. Laura had a very, very prominent one. So. Uh, now don't go back and don't go back and tell her I was talking about her. <laughs> She'll be mad at me. We'll yeah. <laughs> you text it to her, right? Okay. All right. So this originates in the saccule, right? Travels through the uh, uh, the inferior vestibular nerve. It's mediated by the uh, inferior vestibular nerve uh, through the central nervous system. And anyway, the response is recorded on the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And the muscle has to be contracted. And the reason it has to be contracted is because this is a inhibitory response, not an excitatory. Right? That's why the patient has to, uh, has to be able to contract that muscle. And one, the reason the angel is flying on this slide is you can do this test regardless of sensory neural hearing loss. Can't do an ECOG if you have excessive hearing loss, but you can do, you can go, do a CVAMP with no problem because it's not, uh, not affected by central oral hearing loss. Because even though you're using auditory stimulus, you're using auditory stimulus in order to punch the saccule. 
you're just using it at high, as high as you can get out of your equipment, at least 95 dB or 99, 100, 105, 102, as high as it'll go, because you're just punching the saccule with it. Right? There are some people who do it. When I was working with uh, uh, Devin McAllister when he was at Vanderbilt, uh, they set up an apparatus to do head taps. Uh, and I don't know where he got it. I just helped him set up the equipment. I didn't want any part of, of actually doing it. Uh, but auditory stimulus is so much easier. I don't know why you wouldn't do that. Uh, but it is an inhibitory response. We're used to everything being excitatory. This is inhibitory. So the sternocleidomastoid muscle is decontracted each with each stimulus rather than uh, excited. And what could cause an abnormal vamp? All of these things could cause an abnormal vamp. All right. So because of that, if this test is going to be any good, if it's really going to increase the sensitivity of your vestibular testing overall, you can't use it in isolation. You have to use it with uh, a, a dizziness questionnaire, a physical exam. You really got a handle on the patient's symptoms. Uh, and maybe you're going to do other vestibular testing, like uh, a VNG uh, and, and maybe a head impulse test as well. All right. uh, and, and an audio test, because Meniere's disease and conductive hearing loss, all of this affects this test. But this slide is important for you because this kind of gives you what the result would be. Uh, and you can see with most types of pathology, you end up with a response that's either absent or severely reduced in amplitude. Not latency, but amplitude. Where do we put the electrodes? Well, right, you have the patient turn his head so you can see the SCM. And you can see, you can divide it into top, the top third, center third, bottom third. I put it right smack center on the top third. That's where we get the highest amplitude response. And those would be uh, the, uh, one, would, one side would be ground, uh, or you might put the ground on the forehead or something, uh, but you're going to put your uh, negative electrode on the side that, you're, that you want to get the response from, the ipsilateral side. And we used to put the positive electrode down here. Uh, but I, I went to a presentation by Dave Sapala. I don't know if you know him, but he's at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. And he said, you know, I hated putting the electrode down there because on men you had hair. And on women, you just didn't want to go there. So he said he did a, a research project, and he's a statistician. I mean, he, he'll kill you with numbers. Uh, to see if there was any clinical difference between putting the electrode there, like I have in this picture, or putting it up here on the forehead along with the ground electrode. And voila, no clinical difference. All right, so he always puts it on the forehead. If it's good enough for Dave Sapolo, it's good enough for me. So we have everybody putting it on the, on the forehead. And so we're really using the same electrode montage we use for an ABR, except the electrodes that would be behind the ears or on the earlobes, they're on the sternocleidomastoids muscles instead. All right. And what task you do is very important. We used to have the patient just turning their head to contract that muscle. So we turn the head away from the stimulus, and we'd be contracting the ipsilateral muscle. Uh, and the, the, the problem would be is sometimes they would turn their head more in one direction or less in the other direction. You'd have an asymmetry, and asymmetry indicates an abnormality, and you'd have a false positive because they used more effort one way than the other way. And people use all kinds of monitors and everything else for it. I had Neil Shepard tell me once, hey, I got a bright idea. Take a blood pressure cuff, put it on the patient's hand, and have them push their head against their hand to contract the muscle and to watch the meter and do it the same on both sides. We tried that, and that, that stinks. <laughs> so having tried every possible maneuver, the one that works consistently the best is this, and you can't get it wrong. The patient lies supine, and then whenever you start the stimulus, you tell the patient, when, I, when you start hearing this jackhammer in your ear, because it's going to be loud, then raise your head. You're lying supine, and you're going to raise your head so that you can see your entire foot from toe to heel, 
and then turn your head and look at that target that I have on the floor. So the head is raised and then turned 90 degrees and they're looking at the target, they're turning away from the stimulus to contract the ipsilateral muscle. And that gives you a maximal contraction. You can't contract that muscle any more than that. And your chances of, of not being able to do it equally on both sides are it's just, just not there. It works perfectly. So a lot of times people say, well, I have patients that won't be able to do that. How long do they have to hold their head like that? About 15 seconds. But you have patients that might not be able to do it. What's the alternative? Well, raise the back of the exam chair from supine to the 30 degree position that you would do calorics in and let them do it from there. It takes less stomach muscle. Uh, and almost anybody can do it when you raise that. You don't get as quite as much a contraction. The SCM isn't uh, quite the amplitude, but it still works fine. And that would be, that would be another alternative. But that's, that's the way to do it. Use a low frequency stimulus, like 500 hertz or 750, whatever you can get the most intensity out of, but don't go over a thousand hertz tone burst. So it's a tone burst at 500 is ideal, 750 if you can't get enough output at 500. You have to do it at, at least 95, preferably uh, 100, or as close to 100 as the equipment will get. And uh, uh, if you go any lower, the, the, the threshold will be about 90. Go any lower and it won't be there. Uh, unless you have superior canal dehiscence. Then you get an abnormally big response, and the threshold isn't at 90, it's down like around 70 or 65. Uh, all right, so you see, you, uh, okay. So this, this slide is good because this is the whole protocol. Uh, on, some, on a piece of equipment that doesn't have, doesn't have automatic gain control like the Vivo Sonic does, on a conventional equipment, you'd have the gain that's the amount of amplification of the patient, signal from the patient. You'd have that down at around 1,000, unlike with ABR or ECOG, where you have it up at 100,000, because this is a much bigger uh, actual response. And there's a typical response, looks like this. What we do is label this, and we label that either N1 or P1, doesn't make any difference, and label that, so you got the leading trough and the peak here. Uh, and that amplitude, this, this is going to be between 12 and 18 milliseconds. This is going to be between 20 and 26 milliseconds. Uh, and it's this amplitude uh, versus the amplitude on the other side. And when there's an asymmetry ratio of more than 35%, the patient is abnormal. Right? What, I tell, what I tell our users when we're doing a, a VEMP training is just look at the two numbers for those two amplitudes. The amplitude on Laura was, on one side it was 350, on the other side it was 420. Well, I didn't calculate the asymmetry ratio because I didn't care. If there isn't, if, if there isn't a 50% difference between the two numbers, then it's fine. If there's a 50% or more difference between the two numbers, then we calculate the asymmetry ratio. And it's just the difference over the sum, the difference over the sum of the two numbers, the amplitude from, from the right versus the left. Okay. Uh, what else can I tell you? Here's the typical latencies. Okay. That leading peak is going to be between tw 12 and 16 milliseconds. And then the peak is, this is the leading trough, sorry. And then the peak is going to be somewhere between 20 and 26 milliseconds. That's variable from patient to patient. And we don't care about the latency. We just care about the symmetry of amplitudes between right and left. We can set this up on any piece of equipment. And what do you want to know about the response? Is it repeatable uh, from one trial to another? Do I have a true response? Uh, and uh, uh, is there more than a 50% difference between sides? If so, calculate the asymmetry ratio. Very simple. Uh, and if the asymmetry ratio is greater than 35% or greater than 0.35, then it's abnormal. I got that from that website. It's a good website, by the way. This is the calculation of the asymmetry ratio, just the difference over the sum. And this is what a typical response looks like. Well, that, this is on the biologic. Uh, 
here's here's a, a sample of uh, this patient had 321 as an amplitude. This is microvolts on the right, 138 on the left. So that's more than a 50% difference, and we had to do the do the math, and we came out with a 0 0.40. Well, that's considered abnormal because it's over 0 0.35, right? When is it contraindicated? And I'll end with this because my time is up. It's contraindicated if there's a conductive hearing loss, right? Because what does that do? It muffles the punch. We're using, we're using the stimulus to punch the saccule. Uh, or if the patient can't do the task, or he can't do the alternate task. They just physically can't do it. They have a problem with their neck or something, or their back. Uh, or we have some patients who can't find the SCM on them, can't find the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Well, the, you, Dave Sapala says don't do it because the results you get, you won't be able to depend on them. So you've got to be able to find that muscle. And